Well, hello there, church historians. It's so great to see you here in module nine of our church history course, where we're going to focus on modern movements. But before we do that, we will, of course, take our customary trip through the entirety of our, uh, our course to keep you in context with what's going on. Very briefly, we'll look at our handy dandy chart. So we see that we started with the early Reformation, the pre-Reformation we might call it, and then talked about the Reformation, the Bible-based movement of the Word of God becoming clear and available for, for the common believer. We saw how the Catholic Church's counter-Reformation uh, following that, as well as a period of big missions and revivals. Module 5 focused on rationalism and Russians. Uh, the Russian Orthodox Church constantly had done a, 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 a diligent job of going back, as the, as the text does, to remind us of what's going on in the Orthodox Church. Um, we looked at Module 6, Revolt and Revolution. Module 7 was Revivalism and the Rise of Secularism. Uh, last mo the previous module was ideology and experimentation and uh, kind of the troubled and conflict-laden uh, 20th century. And then we look today at Module 9, which encompasses uh, mo uh, modern movements. So hopefully you're ready to dive in. We've, we've looked at this huge amount of Western history, well, really just world history, uh, and hopefully you're kind of connecting the dots. There are many great uh, charts. Rose has quite a few that have timelines that help connect church history to the rest of world history, as well as uh, you can get a big you know, circular chart like I have on the wall over here of a world history and uh, Bible history and see how they all line up uh, and I highly encourage you to do that because those are helpful uh, helpful tools for us. So with that today we get to explore three chapters in your uh, textbook and they have to do with the arts in the Christian West organizing for unity and an age of liberation. Those are the titles given by Dowley in his excellent book that I hope you're reading diligently along with these lectures and uh, from there we will start our discussion with uh, looking at arts in the Christian West. So it is important, it's valuable to note that the arts have had an important part in Christianity, and Christianity has an important, had an important impact upon the arts. All of those things are going on. So we see, first of all, I want us to at least consider that Christianity gives us a reason for artistic expression. You see, within the context of Christianity, we find that man is made in the image of God, and as God is creative and a creator, so humans, people have uh, a, a creative desire, a desire to put things together and make beautiful things just to make beautiful things, right? Uh, whether they reflect uh, values of our cultures or what we see in the world around us to commemorate historical events uh, or to uh, maybe put forth a vision of the world like we wish it would be, well, that all is an expression of what it means or what we, a part of what it means to be created in the image of God. And we find that in within the context of biblical Christianity, we also have the ability and, and need to do things to glorify God. And that, of course, means our artistic expression is going to be involved in that as well. Whether that's great music, great art, beautiful architecture, all these things were given to the, the world, we might say, by the church because of that uh, theological motivation to do so. The next thing we note, and is really important in our understanding of Christianity and the arts, is that Christianity or the church organizations of various kinds have always functioned as a patron of the arts. For many of us alive today, we might have grown up going to uh, various church events that included a cantata or some kind of uh, artistic, musical, theater, theatrical presentation, all of which, again, see, uh, cause the stories and the accounts of Scripture to be told and retold, the message of Scripture to be recontextualized and understood within how it applies to our world today. So we see that Christianity was a, a patron, a bastion of the arts in buildings, in terms of architecture. Much of the most beautiful architecture, history of architecture that we have, revolves around beautiful uh, churches, church buildings, and, and other kinds of uh, buildings for religious or spiritual function. The other thing that we see is that the church service, as it has grown and developed throughout church history, certainly uh, with no... Uh, 
incredible amount of uh, biblical or yeah biblical guidelines as to what a church service must include or what it must look like in fact we find there's a great amount of freedom and what has mankind done made in the image of god redeemed by uh, the working of christ we've seen beautiful art uh, be made in the name of the lord and in desire to glorify the lord we've seen music beautiful poetic readings and um, liturgies that have been built again all bu- uh, working towards that concept of expressing what it means to be made in the image of God and ultimately desiring to glorify God, whether that's in corporate singing or solo singing, uh, in, in terms of maybe designing in previous eras a mass or a you know, a whole musical service of some kind, all the Bach cantatas, we see that uh, Christianity served that function. And finally, Christianity gives us a subject for art. In fact, quite a few subjects for art. We see that our biblical accounts all provide ample value in giving new ways or new uh, stories to tell, not new, but stories to tell and retell that all have intense spiritual uh, value. And they, they're exciting to hear the accounts of David and Goliath and jo- uh, Joshua and the Battle of Jericho and all the other wonderful accounts that we read in Scripture that give us a basis for wanting to then read those and, and our natural compulsion to some, time, some way to dramatize that or make that available or, or, or create an artwork that celebrates that um, amazing event or miraculous event or personality. So um, we see that as a situation that is pretty common, but not just an illustration or artistic expression of the Bible accounts. We also see the, that Christianity provides an opportunity to illustrate those great biblical themes, those themes of love and redemption. and The God who loves us and cares for us has given us ample opportunity to come up with great artistic expressions that um, might show a display of Christian values. So we might say, you know, the little drummer boy and about this king or, or good King Wenceslas, right? Uh, great Christmas songs that uh, s- certainly happen around Christmas time, but focus on this idea of of expressing great Christian themes using creativity and, and going in that sense beyond maybe uh, just what the biblical accounts have to offer and making our own examples in our own lives that that show that and that's in the visual arts and, and in music and, and throughout. Finally, we see that Christianity is provides a subject for art because it imbues every single common person with meaning and value. So, because God is uh, has died to save all of humanity, everyone who will believe is saved by His grace through faith in His Son Jesus Christ and His work upon the cross. We find that a a woman doing her knitting or her sewing can be a subject for a beautiful and moving piece of art because that is a person that's created in the image of God. And so by celebrating even commonplace events and beautiful uh, occurrences uh, through art and through music and through theater is, is moving to us, is meaningful to us. And I think that's very important for us to remember because, as we will talk about a little bit later in the lecture, we'll find that the issues of Christian art are not um, always as simple as they once were. In the most of <laughs> church history, you know, at least going from the 400s forward, and arguably certainly before that, because we see mosaics and artistic works uh, an expression of, of the love of and the adoration of Christ and the glory of God uh, before then. But we see that Christians have constantly sought to use art to both publish the message as well as adorn the beautiful realities of all that God has revealed for us. It's, it's a remarkable thing and a part of our heritage that we oftentimes miss. Now this brings us to a question that we've already d- uh, discussed to some degree, but the issue of idols when it comes to uh, art, right? The problem of humanity's desire to worship things, particularly the creation of our own hands, has been really difficult uh, to figure out throughout church history. So if I, if someone makes a beautiful statue, the question is, is that a simple artistic expression of something that to be to be enjoyed or, or celebrated? Or is that something that others may be tempted to worship as an idol? And uh, again, that problem caused, of course, the situation that we looked at previously in Church History 1 about the iconoclast movement, this movement throughout the church to try to remove and and, uh, get rid of all visual 
representations because in some traditions there was a tragic knee repetition of the idea that these in, carry inherent spiritual value, right? And we saw that particularly to this day in the Orthodox Church, uh, to some degree in the Catholic Church, and uh, we can argue it's just a, a, a landmine or a possible uh, set of problems that any Christian can fall into. And so that has caused a, a tense sometimes relationship with um, with art, and we could argue with uh, music, right? We've looked at what is acceptable or what is deemed to be acceptable within the context of uh, the church worship, and what can we do, and what maybe glorifies man too much or glorifies man's creativity too much and, and distracts from the themes and the uh, the God that we're meant to be focusing upon. So it's not an overly simple discussion as we see, and uh, different Protestant sects have gone so far as to become uh, outright puritanical, of forbidding all kind of uh, visual representation in favor of, you know, maintaining, I guess, their perceived purity of the spiritual experience. Uh, but I don't believe that that's justified in, in those cases or in all cases. So the next question is, is religious subjects or ordinary subjects? Do, does Christian art have to constantly be highlighting only biblical events or, or, or personalities or occurrences? Or can uh, Christian art also include um, common subjects, ordinary everyday subjects? Can a, a novel such as the novels of Dostoevsky or, or even Tolstoy to some degree be adequate illustrations of important Christian themes and even challenges and critiques to the church like in uh, we see in Moby Dick and um, the Scarlet Letter and others, are those critiques to be well reasoned and understood and thought about in terms of real problems or challenges within the church? Or is it that those are, you know, profane, you know, blasphemies or something to that effect, right? So that brings us to that big question, what specifically qualifies something or something artistic as being Christian? Uh, and we see this, interestingly, moving away from the the great period of, let's say, musical composition and, and the like in the glory of God that was uh, pretty direct. And now um, we wonder, does can a song about the beauty of nature also be considered Christian in in its thrust and its value because it brings glory to God and what God has done uh, without being expressly a, a song that, you know, chants out doctrine, right? And these are all important questions that we wind up having to ask uh, pretty consistently as we go forward. And that's a great time to highlight one of the great heroes of the faith, one of my personal heroes of the faith, C.S. Lewis. Clive Staples Lewis uh, was an, uh, a, a, an atheist and had a lost his mother early on, experienced the trials of war and, and all the difficulties of life that one might expect, and wrote this uh, his account of his conversion in a wonderful book that I highly recommend you read called Surprise by Joy, wherein he found that he was unable as a thinking person to avoid or to run away from the reality that the only cohesive biblical or worldview is the biblical worldview. And his um, other works all served to bring about that end. In fact, so creatively um, actualized was this fellow that he provided some of the greatest Christian art and writing specifically, and some of the ideas that continue to inspire the imagination of Christians to this day. So his work as a Christian apologist probably was what put him on the map as being chiefly important, particularly the book Mere Christianity, another one that if you haven't read, you certainly ought to. Uh, it's a valuable, invaluable resource to all of us in the in the body of Christ as he deals with uh, the issue of how to uh, find out or establish whether God exists from a reasonable thinking way without appealing to just simply, you know, authority of th this or that. He works the, his way at just, I believe, very much in his own steps, the steps that he took to come to know Jesus Christ and, and the God of the Bible as the one true God. He also excelled in producing amazing works of allegorical fiction. The Chronicles of Narnia, of course, being this very large, it might be a little bit, uh, a little bit ex going past the truth to call it allegorical, because it is a beautiful set of children's stories wherein the uh, 
relationship with God is imagined in a way that is perhaps more approachable to a young person and a young mind. And those books have, uh, for many, including myself, illustrated central and core truths of the faith and given wonderful creative imagery that we can grab onto and help understand. Until We Have Faces is another book in which he rewrites the story of Psyche and Cupid. And uh, it, while not uh, expressly exploring Christian doctrines, explores some really important issues having to do with the relationship to of the individual to God and fate and things that go on. Um, the Great Divorce is more of a direct allegory as each as individual people who are uh, de- dead and you know doomed to hell are given a day as vacation in heaven uh, only for most of them to find out that it's not a place that they wanted to be because that is a place that constantly glorifies God. And finally, we have to talk about the screw tape letters, uh, at the very least, uh, a fictional dialogue between a junior tempter or demon to a senior demon in this um, invented perhaps hierarchy of the satanic order, and it provides what really effectively becomes um, a tremendous work on what it means to live the Christian life. And that is what gets us to the heart of, of a lot of his writing ministry, is that it approaches practical issues of faith. And so I celebrate nearly every uh, written work of of C.S. Lewis that I have ever been able to get my hands on and read all of it and love it. So um, I highly recommend him as an example of a positive uh, usage of Christian artistic imagination. Again, very uh, accessible and approachable in certain senses, but also not in any way spiritually or um, theologically weak or unbalanced. He is a a remarkable, certainly not a perfect theology, I'll mind you, or or perfect theology by our measure, but a remarkable uh, person who lived his life in pursuit of the Lord and and in desire to uh, express artistically the truths that he came to know through Christianity. Uh, So certainly an important figure in the 20th century and moving forward. That brings us to the issue of Christian poetry. Now, poetry is, of course, a biblical medium. The prophets, as well as the Psalms and the Song of Songs, the Book of Job, and many of the other narratives include long sections of poetry. And it's one of the things that makes so many, some modern translations really unacceptable, at least to me, because you see that the Bible was not just presented as a transfer of information, but it was presented in a style that was beautiful, that was breathtaking, and still today, even in translation, as we read the words of the Psalms, we're affected by the the imagery and the artistry and the structure of the, the intentional design of the words of Scripture. And so we see that poetry is something that we might in the West kind of set off in its own little corner, but God had it as very central to his to his word and a good translation really must strive to adequately answer for the perfection of style of the bible and that leads us to a increased acuity and, and attentiveness to uh, artistic style and and meaning in that regard so we've seen lots of christian poetry uh, but the uh, paradise lost by john milton is a poetic and very liberal liberal in the sense that he adds a lot of information uh, retelling of the fall of man and the fall of satan and it is uh, breathtaking in its beauty. It's, it's again, well worth a read. Any well-read human really should have encountered that and worked with that. The Divine Comedy by Dante Alighieri is another example of very imaginative. He builds more on, uh, less on scripture and more on uh, some of the pseudepigraphic documents and this idea of a journey through hell into uh, the Catholic idea of purgatory and finally into heaven is all a, a trilogy. It's not a comedy in the sense that it's funny, uh, but this was a very powerful tool in creating or establishing a lot of things that became Catholic doctrine as the church was in its earlier phases. So we see again that not that I'm arguing for a purgatory or for the Catholic view of these seven levels of hell or any stretch of that, all the poetic and, you know, uh, things that went on there were remarkable to show that that's uh, a way in which Christians have constantly sought to um, spread our beliefs, right? Even if uh, there's something to be left desired by Dante. 
Uh, John Donne is another great example of a priest who is a pr uh, profoundly gifted, skilled poet who put forth many holy themes and, and, and um, sacred themes in his work, and it's well worth reading. And again, worth a, worth a look. And The Cloud of Unknowing is another example of a sort of a mystical literature from previous centuries that uh, is presented in a very poetic fashion and tries to, seeks to describe things about the, the Christian experience and our union with God the Father through our union with Jesus Christ, really, but our union with God through uh, Christ's sacrifice and life and what it means to live that out on a daily basis. Again, all po uh, presented in poetic beauty, and uh, I think the world, the modern Christian world, could take note on the value of those aesthetic uh, and beautiful choices, such as communicating in a, a poetically satisfying way. We move on to Western music, and we have to point out that Western music also was experienced a huge amount of benefit, if not uh, an unthinkable, unthinkably large amount of benefit, from the influence of Christianity. So Western music has been advanced, preserved, and shaped by the church. As we said, the church was one of the major patrons of the arts and particularly music. So many believers, J.S. Bach and several others, gained the ability to express themselves and express God's glory through the church service, through art, uh, works commissioned by the church, and thus the church shaped the history of Western music for sure, and arguably music at large, as well as uh, the music in, uh, affected and worked the way that the church works, right? Um, so music written for the church in various capacities became the central feature in music history until the time of the Reformation, where we start to see more secular works take place. But even those were done with a, a no, or many of those were done with a knowledge of and a desire to glorify God for this tremendous gift that he's given us to be able to take sounds and arrange them in a meaningful and beautiful fashion that uplifts the soul and encourages us and, and hopefully, again, brings our eyes to the glory of God. We see that music continued to develop along lines that connected to a Christian worldview until the time of modernism and postmodernism began to seek to remove music from the sense of meaning, purpose, and value that it hitherto enjoyed. Um, so as we see, we go further and further away from that time, uh, and now we could argue that music is, is entirely secularized, or at least much music is largely secularized, and yet we still see musical expression most frequently within the church think about it. When do you go, when do people go gather together and sing or make music together? Well, now it's pretty much in church. You might go to a concert, but that's to go hear someone else make music. Um, you're, you're participating and, and people will uh, prepare special music and special songs and so on and so forth. Why? Because they want to glorify God with the gifts, talents, and abilities, and especially that gift of music. So with that very brief consideration of arts in the Christian West as we move forward, hopefully we are um, uh, compelled to continue to seek to create great work that glorifies God and honors God and not um, simply, you know, cheesy Jesus bumper stickers, but true expressions of discipline and desire to reflect something good that God has done or his character or his nature uh, on into the world. That is an uh, uh, essential part of what we're meant to do in the church. So with that, we'll move on to the issue of organizing for unity. Uh, ecumenism, ecumenism is a, an idea that begins to come forward, and as we've seen, there have been kind of little bumps of it along the way, but this is an idea that we need to try to unite all of the division in the doctrinal uh, situation situations that we see arise in the church, as well as all of the divisions in denominations and the like. So the question is, is how can we come back together? Where can we find that common ground? A task that has been far more difficult than the optimist may think. So the desire to wor work together past traditional denominational and doctrinal lines 
motivates and is constantly motivated, at least some Christians, to continue to try to find that common ground and seek to be united as Christians over and against the world. So uh, we see denominational returns, specifically as you get into the latter half of the uh, 1900s, the 20th century, and into the 21st century, uh, denominational returns and reunifications begin to occur. These uh, denominations that had put uh, hard lines, and as we saw in our previous uh, studies, that early on, those, especially early on in, in American history, those denominations were able to work together very functionally, even though they had different convictions. And yet, as this has rolled on, we've seen that many people have kind of cloistered themselves into a smaller hole of their own specific or, or stronghold of their own specific denomination. This led to uh, the 1948 development of the World Council of Churches, one of these efforts to try to see if the church itself, the church universal, can find that ground to work together positively. Um, and yet ecumenism has some problems. First of all, uh, the, the issue of what doctrine is important enough to draw a line at, right? And that becomes a difficulty as the various denominations will take their own point uh, perspectives on whether or not you have to be baptized with their water to be saved means that ultimately they can't work with anybody else because they are so uh, closed around the ritualistic requirements that they've added to scripture that they can't partner with anyone else because they just believe they're saved by faith through work or faith in Christ, right? Or another group, you know, is so defined by their attachment to works or whatever it is. So these denominations, uh, as they are increasingly um, built around the own specific ideas of their own doctrine and, uh, and, and things that they put forth, beliefs that they put forth, we have to ask, is, it, is there a place to draw the line? The answer, of course, has to be yes. And if so, where is that line? Um, and the next question is, is how can the Protestant church or, or churches try to work with the, the Catholic church or the Orthodox church that don't really recognize them in any holistic sense? Now, the Eastern Orthodox church is far more likely to have an ecumenical bent than not, but it still refuses to recognize any Protestant or really non-Orthodox movement as being the church. Never mind, they are the church, similarly with the Catholics. So it becomes a difficult thing when we stray from the biblical doctrine of a believer is saved by faith through grace in Christ and seeks to honor him by knowing and understanding and applying his word, uh, whereas that sounds and, and really is an open invitation for anyone who wants to line up with the word of God. We have these dogmatic assertions that make it very difficult to uh, come to any meaningful point. Uh, in, in that regard. So uh, Catholicism, however, has tried to show some ecumenism, but really, again, more so a, a desire to attract people based upon adopting certain behaviors that have been successful for Protestants. So Vatican I, 1870, we saw established the ex cathedra doctrine, and that was important in the movement towards Vatican II, and the idea of uh, doing two things that were, again, uh, the Catholic Church was losing ground to f against the Protestants, over and against the Protestants. First of all, having masses in the common language, rather than continuing to have the mass delivered in Latin, which was absolutely in unintelligible to most of the people who were uh, Catholic. And by the way, doctrinally, from a Catholic perspective, that makes sense. You're not doing the mass for the edification of the person, you're doing the mass for the uh, satisfaction of God, right? It is a service to God, and that's the, because of the uh, re abhorrent replacement theology and robbing the Old Testament of various pictures and ideas to find your worship order brought about a sit system and a situation wherein um, if they're the ones who are exclusively uh, offered access to God, then no one else can really play. Uh, however, their movement of the mass to the common language made the understanding of what they were doing and teaching or believe themselves to be doing and teaching was uh, available. And then the next move was towards folk masses, which opened up a whole world of Catholic art that had hitherto been somewhat closed off because, well, the Protestant churches would happily sing a new hymn or song that was written that uh, that week or celebrate the uh, a Christian artist that uh, sang or wrote a music that was honoring to God, they were constricted in that by the 
various expectations of what a high mass should look like. And so the folk masses uh, were a sort of answer to that, allowing people to have, let's say, a guitar and folk song, folk music, folk not just in the sense of, you know, folk pop music, but in terms of what is available to the people and what is expressively enjoyable or interesting to the people in terms of being able to worship. So um, this movement of design to work together certainly had some positive impacts and uh, hopefully we continue to see people unite around Jesus Christ and around his word and bring about an increased um, unity and growth within the body of Christ as we understand the the clear teaching of scripture together and seek to apply it and hopefully we'll see few more and more of those uh, denominational lines being shaken away and and erased in favor of a pure and simple biblical faith in Christ that uh, that enables us right to recognize that uh, just because you don't come from my club or you didn't get wet with my water you have been saved by the work of Jesus Christ by faith alone in him uh, which has been problematic even amongst you know many churches that would claim that was the case they would also claim that you need to be in their church to be really safe or to be really in the right place. So um, it's a, it additionally also one of the hallmarks of a cult. Uh, the cults always maintain uh, it's us and no one else, our organization, our you know hierarchy, our flow chart, whatever it is, um, and usually also our extra books. So we see those things as being really important as we consider what it means to be a Christian and how we need to navigate this world in which there are so many different perspectives on what Christianity is and what Christianity is about and what we ought to be doing. And um, I have great hope for the increased unity in the church as we continue to declare the clear uh, word of God. And we'll be able to, uh, by the grace of God and by the working of the Spirit of God and in the saints, I, I think we'll be able to see increased growth and movement in that uh, direction, at least within the confines of the true believing church, the people who truly trust in Christ, the people who truly have faith and confidence in his word. So with that, we come to our final little uh, section of today's, which is the Age of Liberation. So we see that missions were having a tremendous impact upon the world. And this is something that, uh, that was very, I think, known in the 20th century and has become increasingly obscured by the various lies and deceptions. And yet, we see that missions has impacted, uh, has brought an impact through primarily at first the Western culture and brought out to all the world all sorts of things that needed to be corrected. You see, the world apart from Christ and apart from Christianity is not a happy, shiny place. And as you go into these other parts of the world untouched by Christianity or less touched by Christianity, you are likely to see vile and grotesque oppression and slavery. As we saw, uh, Christianity was the primary driving force in realizing that this idea of objective owning another person is grotesque, sickening, and wrong. Furthermore, we saw uh, various cultural things that were used in terms of how women were treated and how uh, people w viewed the idea of marriage that were terribly abusive, usually to women. And yet the introduction or the advent of Christianity in those cultures brought about vast improvements to their uh, their lives even if the church or the world itself or that part of the world itself didn't turn to uh, christianity in entirety or in even in um, the majority we see that the idea of hospitals are a Christian idea that we should care for and seek to heal the sick. And, and the idea of medicine is built upon the idea that God created uh, this world with an order, that sin came in and did something wrong, and that there may be corrective measures to bring about or restore a person to health. Furthermore, outside or apart from or separated from the demonic ideas of karma, or that, hey, if you're sick, that's just what you deserve. You're just getting what you deserve, and I don't want to mess with your karma by healing healing or helping you, we see the Christian uh, West brought about a world in which the disenfranchised, the poor, were meant to be loved and cared for. The world was meant to be, um, the, the, the humans, for lack of a better term, certainly Christians, should be seeking for the best good of their fellow man. And that was wildly unknown, again, in the pagan world. 
And it's important that we give Christianity the credit it's due because the world would le- seek to rob that or steal that from Christianity in a desire to malign what missions really have done. So freedom is a weird thing in the world. And that is the reality that, that, that most of these, you know, most non-Christian cultures, many Christian cultures are built upon concepts of slavery, people being owned or run or, you know, their will being totally given over to the one who is more powerful than, than them or rich than them or stronger than them. And yet the Bible offers dignity to every single person created in the image of God. Every single person with a, a choice to, to be able to accept God's grace or reject it. The, the ability of every person and the importance that every person make their own choice. Thus, for Islam, it's no problem to convert by the sword because it doesn't matter what you actually believe. It's what you do, that you subject yourself, that you submit to it. But Christianity cannot effectively uh, Um, convert by the sword because it doesn't mean anything if I can threaten you or scare you into believing on, on pain of death or torture. Ultimately, that's a choice that you have to make genuinely, individually, between you and the Lord. And so this idea, this ideal, it comes, we call it a Western ideal, but really it's a biblical Christian ideal that impacted the West primarily first and then moves through missions to the rest of the world. So we see in 1910 in Edinburgh, the first world missionary conference, this idea that maybe if we can't all get together as churches and agree about everything and work together positively, at least we can get together and recognize that the world needs the message of Jesus Christ. And evangelism is a major sticking, jumping off point because that's the job, that's the homework assignment, we might say, that the Lord gave us to go make disciples of all nations. So we start to see these efforts having increasing impact in the world. America becomes early on or in, early into the into the 70s the primary force of sending missionaries out of the world. 70% of all missionaries going out into the world in 1973 came from America. So this was a, a movement I believe that uh, that is passed to South Korea, I know, for a time. And there are other nations, praise God, that are now sending out evangelists and reaching unreached people groups and also even sending evangelists back to America to try to call America and Europe back to the uh, roots of our faith and our belief. So the world saw a massive surge in the spread of the gospel and the establishment of churches. And your uh, book gives you some fantastic statistics that I've high graded out. So in Africa, we find that in 2010, there were 38 million Christians in South Africa, 62 million in Congo uh, and, and former Zaire. Uh, 81 million in Nigeria, 28 million in Uganda, 24 million in Tanzania. By denomination in Africa, there were some 165 million Roman Catholics, 150 million Protestants, 100 million independent Protestants, 50 million Anglicans, and 46 million Orthodox, and 21 million unaffiliated. That's a lot of humans. That's a lot of people. The message is getting out there. The message is available, and Christ has a witness in all of these countries and on each of these continents. And that can give us great encouragement and and hope in that the uh, sacrificial efforts of all the missionaries of the past have been uh, blessed and and, uh, meaningful, and that their witness has brought about a remarkable number of folks who would otherwise have been alienated from the gospel or not known the gospel to make it known unto them. In South America, we see very similar figures. In 2010, there were 61 million Protestants, 41 million independent Protestants, and 422 million Roman Catholics. One Latin American writer claimed this is the only area in the world where a Christian church is growing more rapidly than the population, said by Emil Castro. The greatest... uh, growth in the amongst Pentecostals who made up 60 percent of the Protestant total in the seventh and seventh day Adventists. so we see even you know we've got various places people that we have massive doctrinal disagreement with and yet we note that there has been massive effect in South America based upon the footprint left by Christianity left by the biblical faith um, we also see, as we continue to look at the world uh, at, at whole, at a lar- as a whole, at large, 
that communism continues to be a violently anti-Christian force. And as we pointed out, once you've robbed yourself of access to the one true God and found the uh, great fallibility of the polytheistic and witch doctor type religions of paganism, that you're left with trying to build this grotesque secularist religion, and communism is one of those ideologies that continues to be uh, find a ready ear in many people who have rejected God because communism is at odds with the biblical scripture. So we see China and Cuba and various others uh, continue to represent communism as an alternative to the Christian worldview and way to treat people. And of course, this is a brutal uh, movement that has caused many conflicts in world history. And I find it particularly ironic that uh, that those demanding that this world leave religion because it causes violence and oppression have caused more violence and shown more intolerant oppression than religion ever has. Owing back to that same reasoning, you see, in an atheistic world, it doesn't matter what the individuals believe or accept. It doesn't ultimately, you just need to get them to cooperate or kill them, which again, uh, communist, fascist, and, and um, secularist, individualist, nationalist, whatever it is, are always willing to do because to them, human life has no meaning. And anything causing any dissonant in their uh, self-described utopian schema just needs to be eliminated. And again, we see that Christianity, biblical Christianity, doesn't afford that option. Every single person who opposes God is savable by God because of the work of Jesus Christ on the cross. And so we truly are meant to, and hopefully at our best we do, pray for our enemies. We seek to give them and, and share with them the message of the truth, the message of the gospel, seeking to change their mind so that they might place faith in the one who saves is a very uh, important modern issue that is still under a discussion to this day. So it comes to that question, how does Christianity relate to culture? We have seen throughout church history that there are certain points in which the church, uh, institutional at least, had a very large impact and realm of authority or circle of authority as it dealt with how a society or how Western society, European society, or American society might run. And while there were challenges within that because the institutional church is made up of sinful people who will oftentimes work towards their own ends and not altruistically for God's glory, uh, we recognize that the loss of that is bringing this world into an increased state of despair, hopelessness, and madness. So how do, how do we in the modern atheistic and secular world uh, continue to represent Christ in our culture and make Christ a, or rather be a witness for Christ in a culture that seemingly increasingly will reject him and refuse him or choose not to regard uh, the reality and importance of Christianity. And to that, I believe the simplest advice is to continue to keep our eyes fixed on Christ, continue to preach the word, continue to make great art and expression that will bring forth uh, the, the message and expose people to the glory of God as best we can. I think that's our, our goal and our hope is to be salt and light in that regard and continue to make it uh, the opportunity available for the darkened world to find Christ. That brings us to that next question uh, that was brought up by your text that's very important is, are there too many denominations? And of course, we would note that the denominations, while we could argue we fell backwards into denominationalism, that is to say, everybody saying, well, that thing that the Catholic Church is teaching, that's not right. So we're going to go over here, we're going to make our own club, right? And that we're going to make our own club attitude. In fact, so much to the point that uh, one Catholic theologian joked, he said, the problem with you Protestants is that you're always protesting. And so it is. Instead of uh, patiently working through our doctrinal issues, we tend to simply um, dogmatize uh, the other person or is, cause that bifurcation and then dogmatize that as harshly as we can, right? And start to excommunicate or expel or declare the other person a heretic. And, and again, there's a place for that. 
false teachings are prevalent and prominent and they will continue to arise. In fact, Paul said to the Ephesian elders that from among them that, that savage wolves would arise. So we know that there will be uh, false teaching and false teaching must be answered from the word of God. And yet the question of the value and purpose of these superstructures of de denomination and the political and financial force that they exercise on society may well be, uh, I pray, towards the end of its expression. And we can, uh, we, we uh, find that that you know, many multiple different denominations does provide a great deal of confusion. In other words, the world looks at Christianity and says, but you don't have it figured out either. You've got a, a denomination that believes everything from not believing in God at all, virtually totally atheistic denominations that are formalistic in nature. And then you've got your social works in nature. And then you've got, you know, very opposite perspectives on, on that, which include people who fiercely and loyally believe the word of God and the gospel. It's a challenge that we have to face, and hopefully we can grow to a more biblical viewpoint that accepts that everyone who has trusted Christ for salvation, his death, burial, and resurrection, ascension, and seating, is ultimately a part of that family of God. And if we work on those means, I think that's the best progress that we can make in this time, though we will never be uh, in this until the Lord returns, free from false teaching and deception and heresy and the like. Uh, we can move positively towards declaring the truth of the Word of God and bringing unity in our local churches through the means of the working of the Holy Spirit. I also wanted to point out that we've moved to, and we kind of discussed this before, but many missionary movements have gotten to the point of getting to where helping hurts, right? There's a very excellent book written with this topic in mind, and that is essentially making a world that is entirely dependent upon the Western missionary or Western church in some regard. Many times this is because the Western church is more than happy to provide uh, ample funds that are really inappropriate to the cultural and financial economy or uh, the, in which they're investing. Other times it's because they just so we so long to, you know, show how right we are and, and show up and, you know, make that world sur surrounding us. And so uh, we have various churches in the third and developing world that are tragically not building up new leadership within those cultures, the people who are biblically edified and trained up, but rather just looking to the next Western missionary to come in. And we need to move, I believe, very strongly towards movements that seek to equip indigenous pastors and support local churches in their development and seeking after teaching well the Word of God and understanding in a clear doctrine. Supporting indigenous missions, I believe, while there was a, a critical importance in the time of Hudson Taylor and well before, of course, the, uh, the need to have someone go and tell them about the, the word of God. Now we see in many countries that the indigenous church uh, and churches have begin to, begun to grow and flourish, and we don't benefit them by you know, going and making them more Western dependent, whether that's for money or program or uh, or personnel, but rather by seeking to build them up and encourage them as we go forward in that desire. So, uh, hopefully you've enjoyed this lecture a little bit more concise than the last, but because we had a little less um, information to cover, that makes sense. If you're going to complete this module with Colorado Biblical University, you'll have to have read chapters 40 through 42 in the Dali. The lecture, this lecture that you're hearing, participate in the discussion class. And of course, in order to complete this module, you'll have to complete your final biographical sketch and the assignment quiz, uh, which we'll share with you uh, through the official means. And lastly, your next and final module, module 10, will not be complete until you finish your three page paper on a specific doctrinal movement or uh, doctrine, doctrinal development or movement. Um, in the latter uh, half, we might say, of church history and church history too. With that, I hope that you have been edified by uh, our course thus far and, and are looking forward to the final uh, section of it. And I pray that God would richly bless you, that we would use the understanding of God's uh, movement through the flow of church history in order to best glorify him and bring uh, all to a knowledge of Jesus Christ. May God richly bless you.